had sent out a signal to other Spartans earlier, and the Ascendant Justice picks it up, Master Chief knows what it is. They know Spartans are still alive. The soldiers take a spirit and fly down to pick up Alpha and Delta, but get sidetracked at Camp Independence, where the Chief reunites with Spartans from Red Team Gamma, Lee, Anton, and Grace, and meets Admiral Whitcomb. Whitcomb tells them that he armed multiple prototype Nova Bombs, weapons of mass destruction capable of destroying planets, and they have 20 hours to get out of there before they go off. About that time, the Covenant AI slips out of Cortana's quarantine and broadcasts to the surrounding Covenant that the Ascendant Justice is under enemy control and gives them Cortana's upgrade to the slipspace drive, foreshadowing to Halo 2. Cortana is forced to take immediate evasive action and leave Reach's orbit, with the Chief on the planet. Cortana kills the AI as it declares that it will go to heaven in non-copy state. She finds this code extremely familiar and like her own, but copied a million times, each time introducing more and more errors. Though never confirmed, it's implied that the Covenant AI is based off of a copy of Cortana, created in the future with code thanks to the crystal and sent back in time because of it. She admires the alien copying code and makes use of it herself, creating a smaller version of her translation matrix in order to improve her ability to understand Covenant transmissions. As she engages the copying code, she feels like she glimpses infinity. The Covenant AI saw indefinite copying as hell, but she sees it as heaven. With her new and improved translation program, she analyzes Covenant transmissions and learns that there is a Covenant fleet en route to Earth. The characters themselves never make the connection, but it's left implied to the reader that the Covenant have no idea that Earth is a UNSC stronghold, let alone humanity's homeworld, and are going there simply because they know about the Accession, the Forerunner portal generator buried under Voy Kenya. Halo 2 Anniversary would confirm in 2014 that the Covenant were pointed there by a Forerunner device found on Meridian, and have no idea that humanity is there. Regardless, humanity is in epic danger. With all that hanging over them, Time for some thrilling heroics. The Chief leads Red Team Gamma into the Forerunner facility to rescue the others. The Covenant presence is dense. Fortunately, as long as they have the crystal in their possession, the Covenant won't use anything other than very precise shots. The Chief leads them all, including Admiral Whitcomb and the Marines of Camp Independence, into the captured spirit and make a mad dash for orbit, not knowing that the Ascendant Justice isn't there. The crystal does something weird with the gravity and makes it go much faster. They emerge in a mass of Covenant ships, all converging on their position. Meanwhile, Cortana takes the Ascended Justice to a trash UNSC ship. She uses the Covenant engineers and UNSC drones to merge the two ships into a freaky hybrid. With her combined resources, she executes a jump into the heart of the cluster, rescuing the spirit at the last second and making a quick jump away. Yeah! Hoorah! <laughs> But wait, the Forerunner Crystal did something weird! Instead of allowing them to escape, it created a bubble in slip space containing them and the Covenant ships. They try to fire on each other, but physics have changed and fired plasma lances around randomly and endangers everyone. They have to fight in physical or close quarters ways. Just in time, a group of stealth elites make themselves known on the ship by messing with components. One of them is most likely the Guardian of the Luminous Key, probably Thelvotomy. The Chief takes a unit to fight the Elites. This ends in two male Spartans, Anton and Lee, and Pulaski dying, and the Chief getting knocked out. Presuming that the Guardian of the Luminous Key is Thelvotomy, he must escape and hide somewhere in the ship. The Chief wakes up in the Gettysburg Medical Bay, surprisingly emotional about the loss of his fellow soldiers. He especially muses on Pulaski, and thinks that she might have made a good Spartan. I feel like this revisits the death of Fohammer and gives the Chief a chance to care about something like it. In the game, Cortana is audibly hurt by Fohammer's death, and that gives weight to the scene for the player that doesn't quite translate to the Chief as a character. In order to facilitate the player being able to imagine themselves as the Chief, the Chief himself doesn't have a lot of character, and he is written as very cold. Throughout this adventure, the Chief starts to actually care about things, the people he fights with and he becomes more than simply an empty vessel for the player. From a storytelling standpoint, it rings false that he cares more about one soldier he recently met than two of his Spartan siblings. Even if this is intentional because he only just started to care, it's weird that this discrepancy isn't pointed out. Spartans as larger-than-life heroes with very little personality to speak of are hard to conceptualize, and I imagine they're hard to write with, so I can imagine that they felt very disposable to the author. 
Adult Spartan 2s just aren't that interesting, leading to frequent flashbacks to them as children and future books dealing with other generations of Spartans that can be more individualized. From a feminist standpoint, there are two competing issues, the value of female characters versus the association of femininity with emotional vulnerability. On the one hand, it's important that the female characters not be disposable. On the other hand, it fits right into traditional gender roles that it be the female character to elicit that kind of sympathy from a stoic male character. It might be more progressive for him to get emotional about the death of a man. During his recovery, Dr. Halsey presents him with an ethical conundrum. Sergeant Johnson's cancer made him immune to the flood infection, but now he has flood DNA in his system and Wolverine's healing factor, which might be the explanation for why he has NPC immortality in Halo 2. This superpower will be retconned away in the Halo graphic novel, but it's very real to Halsey and the Chief in First Strike. If Oni finds out that Johnson is the Amazing Flood Man, they will dissect him and probably subject a million test subjects to cancer-inducing radiation to try to replicate the effect. She gives him two reports, one that leaves nothing out and one that omits the detail about Johnson. He can submit the standard report and nothing changes. He serves a cold fascist regime and sacrifices his friend for the Oni techs. Or he could submit the altered report and see how deep the empathy hole goes. Halsey is feeling like maybe she's been making the wrong choices and she wants to change her ways and fix her mistakes. Her greatest crime was in the abduction and abusive raising of the Spartans, so she wants to undo some of the brainwashing and make the chief more human. He feels empathy now, but is still brainwashed, so he intends to give Oni the complete report and doom Johnson. <laughs> Say what? Meanwhile, the crystal won't stop emitting deadly radiation for as long as they're in the slip space bubble. They need to go to normal space. The cold protocol won't let them go to any human colony undiscovered by the Covenant, but they need to go somewhere friendly. So the chief makes a bold suggestion. Take the ship to the asteroid belt of Eridanus, where the Spartans engage the traitor Robert Watts and his group of rebels in 2525 in Fall of Reach. The Covenant glassed the local human planet Eridanus 2 in 2530, but the rebels are sneaky enough to have survived, and indeed they have, now led by a pirate named Jacob Giles. This makes another ugly reflection of the Fall of Rage adventures, where our heroes form an alliance with the rebels against the common enemy of the Covenant ships that got dragged along by the crystal. This is a fun part, but not as fun as it could be. The POV characters do not like them, so even though they're a bunch of charming pirates, they're framed as pure scumbags. I much prefer the romanticized characterization of Lyra Castilla in Halo Evolutions to Jacob Giles here. Giles has a personal craft that used to be an Oni stealth ship. It's supposed to have zero of its original capabilities, and Giles never indicates otherwise, but Halsey recognizes that it does both stealth and slip space drive. Instead of telling anyone about it, she decides to steal it and take her and Kelly into another book. Before she goes, she makes sure that the number of female Spartans in the story is maintained. Previously, Pulaski recovered several cryotubes from the Pillar of Autumn. Most of them didn't make it, but one did, containing a Spartan named Linda. Linda is described as awesome in every way, and I get the impression that she's supposed to be a female counterpart to the Chief. The cryotube just hangs around for most of the book, and it takes forever for Linda to join them in the story, but Halsey manages to revive her safely just before she leaves. On her way out, she tells Locklear that it's important to destroy the crystal to keep it from falling into enemy hands. He wraps it in C7, future C4, and moves to what he thinks is a safe location before detonating it, but its mysterious crystal powers magnify the explosive output and kill him. I kind of feel like this is a punishment for him distrusting the chief like Major Silva. Hefferson recovers some shards of the crystal, but others are missing, like they re-entered slip space. Presumably to show up in another book, but retcon, retcon, retcon. Everyone's mad at Halsey, but they must think fast when another Covenant squadron shows up at their doorstep. Whitcomb thinks that the odds are not in their favor, so he makes the hard choice to sacrifice the rebels and run away. Now without the crystal, they can use slip space normally. Knowing that the Covenant Armada on its way to Earth is going to stop at a Covenant supply station called the Unyielding Hierophant, they decide to make a first strike on the station. Whitcomb will take the Ascendant Justice Gettysburg to Oni and pass on the warning about the Armada, and the Spartans will take a spirit to the station. Cortana uses the Covenant AI code to copy part of herself, 
so that the chief could take an AI with him without jeopardizing Cortana. The copy is described as submissive and distinct from Cortana herself. It's just a shadow. Before leaving, he gives Haverson a report to give to Oni. Again, he considers which one to give and again decides that it has to be the one that has the full truth about Johnson, because it's his duty. The spirit successfully makes it to the station, and the copy of Cortana gets the Covenant to tow it inside for repairs. The Spartans are finally back together and can fight as one fluid unit. But something's different. The Chief has started to soften, so now Linda, his feminine counterpart, looks hard in comparison. A minor but decent use of a female character, they quietly infiltrate the station. The clone Cortana is put into the station's network, where she proves useful. However, she needs to be physically brought to another terminal, so she comes up with the idea to make another copy to send with the Chief. It seems like a great plan. Just make a copy. But this copy is a little off. It's not as good as the first clone, which is not as good as Cortana. Each copy makes things a little worse. The convenience outweighs the cost, so the Chief accepts that this AI won't be as good and authorizes the Cortana copy to be able to access the code to copy herself. Sure, that makes sense. Why not? I'm sure there's no Fantasia-like disaster looming in the future. A couple brutes discover them and fight. In the original edition, they encounter brutes for the first time to build hype for Halo 2. Unlike the Engineers, Brutes were not supposed to be in Halo Combat Evolved and couldn't be presumed to be around at the same time in the background. This was the much-anticipated reveal of a Halo 2 alien. And then Halo Contact Harvest indicated that Brutes were part of the first contact and no less familiar than Grunts. So the 2010 edition removed the Discovery aspect and has them just encounter Brutes. That makes sense from a continuity standpoint, but I do feel that there is something lost by the Spartans not being thrown off by their appearance. A Bruf gets the Chief into a chokehold for a tense scene and Grace is torn apart by brute shots. And it doesn't make as much sense without the element of surprise, not knowing their enemy's capabilities. Originally, we read it with horror at how strong this new alien was. But with the retcon in place, it just comes across as them being careless for not understanding Brute's capabilities. Something that should have been drilled into them years ago. The death of Grace is as stilted as the deaths of the two male Spartans earlier. It cements that it's not about gender, just that Spartan 2s are disposable in the eyes of the author. The Chief is slightly more upset over her death than you might expect him to be, though, hinting at his growing empathy. They get the Cortana copy to the terminal, and she starts overloading the reactors to destroy the station. Not a very original plan. That gives the Spartans 10 minutes to escape. They run through a mess of Covenant forces on their way to the exit. The Cortana copy in the network has difficulty fighting against Covenant security bots, so she makes a few more copies. Why not? However, the little errors that show up make it difficult for her to use all of the copies effectively, so she just makes more copies, soon amassing hundreds of them, all struggling to remain coherent, with the errors just getting more and more profound. The Master Chief friend will make it to the exit with almost eight minutes to spare, but Linda remains inside to cover them. The Chief decides to save his friend or die trying. He tells Fred and Will to wait three minutes and then leave if he's not back in time, and then he runs back inside for Linda. He retrieves her and heads for the exit, but by that time the Cortana copies have massively degraded and they can't get the door open. He and Linda try to blast it open, but it still holds. Fortunately, Fred and Will come back for their friends and blast it open from the other side. They escape into space and get outside of the blast radius, but it's still hopeless without a ship. Fortunately, Whitcomb decided to come back for the Spartans. He detached the hybrid ship and has the UNSC Gettysburg, now outfitted with the Covenant slipspace drive, pick them up while he and Haverson personally steer the Ascendant Justice toward the unyielding Hierophant. Whitcomb sends out a challenge to the Covenant to come and get the Forerunner Crystal, sending them a hologram of it so that they would all swarm to his ship in time for the station to explode and kill them. He sends the Chief a message telling him to take care of this ragtag group of people in his command, and the Chief promises to do so. The Gettysburg jumps away, finally heading to Earth. Presumably the lobotomy, most likely as the Guardian of the Luminous Key, survives the explosion and is brought to High Charity to stand trial for the destruction of Halo. By the time I learned the demon's intent, there was nothing I could do. You see, the demon was always going to retrieve the Shard of the Gods three weeks earlier, and the only way this could be accomplished was if the Holy Light could send him backwards into the past, and the demon would not do that until after he commandeered the Ascendant Justice, following his destruction of the Sacred Ring. So you see, I am not to blame at all for anything that happened on this mission. That 
That was the worst excuse I have ever heard. Nay, it was heresy. Cortana reviews the mission logs and worries that the fate of her copies foreshadows her own fate. The chief is now more of a caring guy, so he compliments her to make her feel better. She blushes, which supports the underlying Chief Cortana romance hinted in the series. Are you dating Master Chief? That's complicated and personal. Sergeant Johnson gives the chief the report that the chief gave to Haverson, so now he has the chance to make the decision again. He thinks about it. He now understands the importance individuals can make, and he destroys the report that would doom Sergeant Johnson. He decides the other report would have to do. The chief is not the simple brainwashed soldier that he was in his introduction in Halo Combat Evolved. He has gained a conscience and respect for his fellow soldiers. First Strike leaves him with the potential to become a much more developed character. This unfortunately will not be followed up on to the same extent as Sergeant Johnson, but it gives First Strike a note of progression and growth to lead Halo into its next stage of life with Halo 2. There is an epilogue in which Tartarus presents three shards of the Forerunner Crystal to the Prophet of Truth, or to unused concept art of the Prophet of Truth that became obsolete when Halo 2 came out. Tartarus is also compared to hunters in such a way as to suggest that hunters were still considered individual animals and not hive minds of alien eels, both not updated for the 2010 version. It is suggested that time travel will continue to be a major theme of the Halo Expanded Universe, presumably with Time Traveling Covenant, but this is never followed up on. Aside from the Isle of Bees slip space anomaly, time travel is pretty much restricted to this time loop, and it is a loop, not a horseshoe. It seems like the Covenant recovered a massively degraded Cortana copy from the unyielding Hierophant, taught it the Covenant ideology, and sent it to the Ascendant Justice and possibly other ships in the Covenant Navy, if we're not going with the idea that it's the Guardian of the Luminous Key. On the Ascendant Justice, Cortana killed it and took its ability to copy itself. Now where did that code come from? There's only one answer, and it's stupid. The Crystal did it. The Crystal did everything. Why did it do it? Because it was always going to do it. And being able to shoot a gun accurately gives you magic navigation powers. Overall, First Strike is a corny military science fiction space opera that throws in a bunch of elements to try to deepen the Halo universe with varying degrees of success. The time travel is interesting but introduces problems. If the crystal is responsible for making the chief arrive in time to take it off of reach as a matter of fate, then the player's whole effort in playing Halo Combat Evolved is less meaningful. Yeah, that wasn't your talent that finished the game, the crystal did it. You were always going to finish the game. It's just generally unsatisfying for there to be a faded time travel plot device fought over like the One Ring in a semi-serious sci-fi setting. This ring is mine. Johnson becoming a Flood-based superhero is a great addition, but I wish Bungie didn't feel the need to retcon away first chance they got. He could have been really interesting with ties to the Flood and superhuman abilities. He could have been able to duel the Grave Mind to help save Cortana or something. Alas, his Flood powers are restricted to fanfic. As a character, Johnson still isn't much more than the Master Chief sidekick, but actually trying to make him into a character leads to the compelling character he becomes. Bungie then put him in Halo 2, a badass retcon comic about his escape from the Flood, and then he gets his own book. So, Johnson, when are you gonna tell me how you made it back home in one piece? Sorry, Guns. It's classified. The biggest change is trying to broaden the characters Halsey and John, the Chief. Halsey is mostly set on doing whatever it takes for the greater good, but she starts thinking that the greater good is based more on individuals than whole societies. She teaches John the importance of individuals, and he incorporates that into his growing empathy and makes the choice to save Linda in the heat of battle, and then Johnson when he can think with a cool head. He takes a step to go outside of the restrictive role that he has as a generic power fantasy to become a real developed character. And this goes nowhere, unfortunately. I mean, I guess Halo 5 has similar themes, but that's 343i doing their own thing. It's not First Strike. From a feminist perspective, it could be better, but is pretty decent. There is a smattering of decent female characters, Pulaski, Cortana, Linda, Grace, Kelly, Halsey, who give the book a decent feminine presence. As I've discussed, there are issues. To a significant degree, gender roles are not challenged, and we have Kelly's contrived superpower to go with McKay's feminine intuition. 
Though arguably John has his luck too. A lot is made of Linda's ability, and it is nice to have a woman as the chief's counterpart, but he does have to rescue her. The story Petra and the Adjunct makes it clear that a greater feminine presence could be desirable. The worst part is the fascist theme. Derivative of its source material, Starship Troopers by Robert A. Heinlein, the UNSC as it is currently represented is a fascist regime portrayed in a mostly positive light. Though Halsey's actions in kidnapping children are generally portrayed bad and the chief choosing to save Johnson is a good thing, the book positively portrays the willingness to do whatever it takes to stop what is presumed to be a greater threat. I did what was required. And the book never stops to question if the rebel threat is indeed as bad as would justify the Spartan program. The rebels featured are portrayed as slimy bad guys with no room for nuance. Even knowing that the UNSC is willing to abduct children to put down a rebellion, we're to take the UNSC as the good guys and hate those evil rebels that oppose it. The various references to American history characterize the UNSC as modern day America taken a step further. As it is an American product, we are supposed to take these as markers that they are the good guys, America. The various references to the Civil War, like with the name Gettysburg, indicate that the rebels are essentially the Confederates and thus bad guys. The Ascendant Justice Gettysburg at the Eridanus Rebel Base, I imagine to be a reference to the Battle of Gettysburg. When Whitcomb gives the order to abandon the rebels to the Covenant, he admits that it's morally questionable, but we are to celebrate his devotion to doing whatever it takes. And given the priming of the negative portrayal of the rebels, we don't care so much about their lives and instead appreciate Whitcomb and his later noble sacrifice. The worst part is in the treatment of the engineers. Upon meeting an alien slave race, our hero's first instinct is to treat them as slaves and use them as such. The thought of liberation and treating alien people as people never enters their heads. Does that sound like the respectable North in the Civil War to you? Haverson's willingness to kill one is portrayed as cold, but still in the right because of his willingness to do whatever it takes. And later he is given a noble sacrifice with Whitcomb like keys in the flood. Whatever it takes is used as a catch-all excuse for all manner of criminal behavior. When I was younger, I was aware of the fascist tone, but didn't really care that much. I could appreciate it just on a level of a corny space adventure. But as the years go on, I found it increasingly disturbing. The United States has been at war for years and years and become increasingly militarized, with numerous war crimes that slip by under the justification of good guys versus bad guys. And the US military has used Halo as a recruitment tool. Hello and welcome to the first basic combat training for Halo 3 brought to you by the US Army. The purpose of these videos is to give you the skills that you need to succeed in the upcoming Halo 3 tournament coming in the new year. And log on at xbox.com slash US Army for more information. With Americans uniting over hate and allowing a demagogue like Trump to even get in the position to be elected, I can't allow something as problematic as this glorification of abusive military culture go unchallenged. The good news is that Halo does get better. Starting with Contact Harvest and Coal Protocol, and especially Glasslands, the Halo series grows up and starts viewing the future as a gritty dystopia where the UNSC is problematic, only certain rebel factions are monstrous, and some rebel groups are sympathetic. First Strike is merely an example of Halo in its troubled infancy. The 2010 edition has a collection of short stories following the main story, included as a bonus to get people who already own the first edition to buy the second too. The stories are uncredited. Only one author is known for sure because he brought it up on Twitter. These come from the mature era of Halo and it really shows. The first is a somewhat sympathetic take on the Rebels. It starts out as a letter from a guy named Charles to a widow whose husband Sam died as a hero in the war. My first thought was that this was Sam Marcus, the tech from the Pillar of Autumn who thinks about his wife left at home in the first chapter of The Flood. As the letter goes on, it starts acknowledging class differences and how people from Earth are treated better than people in the outer colonies, which we've seen in Isle of Bees to be accurate. And it comes as a slap in the face how mature this writing is compared to First Strike. The letter ends with the reveal that Sam was a rebel who died fighting the UNSC. And it ends on a nicely ambiguous note, to contrast with the sharply black and white treatment of the Eridanus rebels from First Strike. The second one is about a private citizen named Oliver Birch, who only hires to salvage slipspace drives from wrecks in orbit of a glass planet Biko. He realizes that the one he's dealing with is actually a prototype from an Oni vessel. 
He is late for a date with a woman named Gretchen on another planet, so he decides to try out the Oni Drive to go super fast. It is only a prototype, however, and it destroys his ship. He grabs his dog and seals them both in a cryo chamber, the cornier version of the ending of Halo 3. The story has a classic sci-fi feel with semi-realistic events, if you accept slip space as a thing, and a corny tone that makes me think Frank O'Connor is a likely candidate for the author. For a story about a guy who does the sci-fi equivalent of a jackass stunt, it has a very human feel, with a note of the love this man feels for his dog. I'm sure dog rates would rate her 12 out of 10 wood pet. Gretchen is treated in a manner similar to Lyra from Evolutions, and even if she doesn't get an active part in the story like Lyra does, there is that same respectful tone. All in all, it's a cute little story. The third story is a transcript of a psychological evaluation of Fred by a jackass Oni operative named Veronica Clayton. This does a good job of fleshing out Fred as a character and his emotional state in his early scenes in First Strike. Nylon does a decent job, but he does neglect some of his character development, so the story helps develop Fred. Dr. Clayton is a good female villain, derivative of Perengoski and Osman, and Lord Hood even shows up to connect her to the former as part of a hook for Glasslands which would have been the next book coming out. After First Strike, she is very refreshing as both a female character and as a villain. The hell with Ackerson and Halsey. Give me that matriarchal Oni villainy. Finally, the fourth story is Petra by Christopher Schlurf, about a war journalist named Petra Janasek, contemplating the Human Covenant War in its final days. Unlike the promotional material for Halo 3 that featured Jake Courage, war photographer, Petra isn't anywhere near the action. She's on a completely different planet, Borsetti, so we only get her and her thoughts. It's a compelling psychological narrative, and this is a wonderful example of a female character, in stark contrast to Belaski and Ethan Halsey. Nyland's writing really has its limits. This is the kind of respect I look for in the treatment of a female character, and it is a great illustration of the feminist tone of the mature era of Halo. The original Halo novel trilogy has its place in the canon, but I think it works best as a foundation to the better writing of the novels to come. Please remember to like, share, subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and email me if you want to be put on a waiting list for a paid commission video. And if you don't like what I said, don't flame, it's not my fault. The crystal engineered everything.